All right, we are live. Sorry for the delay there. I uh, got some access to some film that I, I really wanted to add into this, this kind of bonus presentation um, that we're going to run here. Um, talking a little bit about, about CFL offense and, and then in the next hour, some CFL defense. So uh, thanks for sticking with me. It's a, it's a rainy uh, Saturday afternoon here uh, in Ontario. Um, and so I, I thought I'd throw together a little something if, for, if people were interested to hop on here and, and learn a little bit more about some of the trends um, that, that I was looking at in the CFL season, obviously now from two years ago, as we get closer to the start of the new CFL season. Um, so we are, we are going to go live now. I know I originally had it at two o'clock and then, and then back to up to three. Um, but it gave me a chance to get some film that I hadn't had access to previously, um, in here, which I think is great. Uh, and really I, I came to the thought of doing this talk today. Um, you know, just, just to talk a little bit about, you know, what are some concepts that I think coaches could use at any level, um, that would be really, really effective, uh, that I'm seeing in the CFL game. And I think, you know, there's obviously when you're watching the TV cut, you, you see so much um, and, you know, you get access to, uh, you know, an opportunity to learn some through that. But when you get a chance to watch the coaches cut, um, obviously, like anything, you know, you're able to, to see a little bit more. Um, and, and I think there's some things that high school coaches, even youth coaches can use. Uh, and when you're developing a Canadian offense, um, you know, I, I think that there's certain things that you know, you can take from the American game and there's certain things that have already been adapted in a way um, that really, really uh, allow coaches to be successful. So uh, I'm just going to send out a quick tweet here that we are live and we will get going. As always, uh, hit us up with any questions you have in the chat. Um, it's very uh, helpful to us if you throw a like on the, on the video. It helps more people find it. Um, and we'll be going through both CFL offense and defense this afternoon. So there's something for everybody. All right, tweets out, we are ready to go. Uh, so I wanted to break it down into kind of five easy things. As always, you can find us at all, we, at all of these uh, social media handles, at 3 Down Dev on Twitter, at 3 Down Development on both um, TikTok and Instagram, and of course, to our YouTube channel where you're watching us now. So I wanted to break it down into kind of five easy, uh, easy in quotation marks, but five things I think, you know, coaches at a variety of levels could use um, and I tried to keep it, you know, not specific to certain formations or anything like that, more concepts that you could build into whatever formations that you're already running. Uh, and one of them is, is what a lot of people call zone read slice. You'll see a, a ton of film of this in the CFL. Basically, you're going to, you know, block your traditional inside zone up front, read the backside defensive end, and then have uh, your H or your slice player, whoever it is, can be a fullback, um, can be any receiver based on, you know, how you align that player is going to uh, cross the formation and usually you're going to try and run some kind of either flood or rub concept uh, to allow them to get into space uh, if they get the ball. So basically you run a zone read up front, you're going to read the defensive end. I think most people are pretty familiar with that. Uh, if not, there's a ton of resources that you can, uh, you can get access to uh, about running zone read. But the thing I think you see probably in the CFL game is, is the H or, or whatever you call that receiver coming underneath the set uh, and leaking into the flat. And I think that that um, presents some challenges to offenses. Uh, and I think one of the main ones is if you're playing zone, flood concepts are great. If you're playing, if you're facing a team that's playing man, you know, this pick concept I have drawn up is great. So we'll watch some of it when we get to the film, but you can imagine, you know, if, if this is zone, right, and nobody tracks from the other side of the field, okay, you're going to get a horizontal stretch on the flat defender. Um, and if this is man, this pick route is going to pick, say it's the W tries to track across or, you know, say the, the halfback goes high and the free safety comes down. Either way, you're creating a pick for that player um, as, as the H gets into the flat. And the thing this allows you to do, I think, especially in high school, is if your quarterback's one of your best athletes, get them on the perimeter with the opera, uh, opportunity to throw the ball down the field or hit the slice coming underneath. And we'll watch some film uh, of about four or five different ways to do that. Um, when we get to the film. Second one here is uh, just a basic slant RPO. This is something that, you know, in my time with Laurie, we had a ton of success with. 
Uh, it's something that I've had a ton of success with at the, at the high school level um, with summer league kids with the Cambridge Lions. Really simple, really kind of the base RPO in most spread offenses. Um, some some version of this. The reason I like slants versus stops is it's better if you get man to man. So the first thing a team's going to try and do uh, if you're you know being successful RPOing them is play man to man. Um, so I like to teach it where you know you kind of got those zone rules. Uh, where you're going to sit down in, in a hole in the zone if one presents itself, um, but you're you're going to you know run your slant through if it's man to man, and that just gives you a chance to really isolate defenders. So even if you get man to man coverage, you've got two slant routes against man to man. You want to be able to win in those matchups, um, and, and it's a play that makes it really challenging on defenses. So you know you're going to now instead of like we saw in the zone read on the previous slide where we're going to block the Sam linebacker and we're going to leave the defensive end here. We're going to leave the Sam linebacker uh, and we're going to base block back on the defensive end um, and now isolate that Sam in conflict between dropping to their hook to curl zone, which would help them cover the slant or um, being able to uh, play the run, the B gap, uh, which is their fit in, in, in most run fits. You'll notice a lot of these are out of 23 um, it's a formation I love to run RPOs, whether it's uh, whether it's zone read slice or the slant RPO. Um, not the only way you can do it. You can do it lots of different ways. We'll see some examples of this out of a four by one set as well. Um, you know, you can do this in the boundary uh, out of three by two. But one of the keys is identifying, you know, how the defense is adjusting and who the conflict player is. Uh, and that's something that if you haven't watched our series on RPOs, um, being able to identify as a defensive coach who your conflict players are and where they are in certain formations. And then as an offensive coach, being able to identify, Hey, who's in conflict here. Um, and, and how can we pick on them is a, is a critical skill in the modern game. And I'd highly recommend that, that video series that we did a few months ago uh, on defending RPOs. Even if you're a, even if you're an offensive coach, uh, it's really good just to talk about, you know, what is a conflict player and how do you know who's in conflict? Um, so very, very simple. If it's man to man and the Sam, you know, isn't responsible for that hook to curl, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be pretty optimistic. We can win one of those two slant routes. If the Sam, uh, if the Sam's a zone coverage player, even better. Now we're going to get that slant route in that zone coverage window behind them. You'll see there, I have the, the little stop option here for the outside player. Basically if the half's low, we don't want to run into the half. So we'll run the stop. Uh, if the half's high, we can continue to run the slant. Um, and really, really important here, um, this player, you know, can't can't get too flat. So they need to make sure that they get enough vertical down the field that the timing matches for the RPO. One of the things that I've seen mess this up is when your Y gets jammed and then they run their slant at two yards and they're able to get a little bit of separation, but the field half is able to catch up before the quarterback's ready to pull and, uh, pull and throw the ball, um, you got to get to your depth and run that slant. So zone slant RPO, another thing we're going to look at today. Third thing, and this is something I've seen in a variety of ways, and, and I struggled with how to categorize it because um, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. Um, but for me, it's your kind of play action flood in the boundary. And the reason I like that is it shortens the throw. Uh, and I think, you know, you're obviously, depending on the ability of your quarterback, that could be more or less important to you. Um, but I think you can get the ball further downfield into the boundary, no matter how strong your quarterback's arm is. And it just gives you some options um, in terms of what routes you want to run. Sometimes when you run those play actions to the field, if your quarterback can't make the throw, they're not going to make the throw confidently. They're not going to make the throw consistently or on time. Um, you're better off to do it in the boundary. And it's something that I saw both at the U sport level and um, – and the CFL level is a bunch of different versions of what I'm calling this play action boot settle, where basically you're going to, it looks like you're going to run bootleg back to the field and your quarterback's going to settle up and actually throw uh, flood routes back into the boundary. So we'll look at a few aspects of that. The other reason I like it is it gives your quarterback shorter throw. Like I mentioned, you can, like we'll show, have a variety of pass actual concepts within it. Um, but you can hit the same spots on the field, keeping your reads consistent. And the other thing is it gives you a chance to do a little bit of max protection. You know, I think if you look at the first two plays we looked at, those are all stay ahead of the sticks plays, convert second and four to six type plays, important plays in an offense. But every offensive coordinator knows you're going to have to hit some shots. Uh, you're going to have to hit some chunk plays. You're going to have to throw the ball down the field. Uh, you know, and, and any good run game uh, affords you the opportunity 
to to take some of those shots, whether it's on first down uh, or second and short in the passing game, where you're going to try and chunk. Hey, we're going to try and go get 8, 10, 12, 18, 24 uh, on this play by throwing the ball downfield and then hopefully getting some run after the catch. So um, I think it's an important part of any offense, and, and there's a lot of different ways the CFL teams do it. Obviously, some of their quarterbacks – you know, can throw the ball down the field to the uh, to either side of the field. They can hit those deep comebacks and, and things like that. But I thought this particular uh, style of play action would be beneficial to to some some people coaching quarterbacks, maybe at a younger age or certainly at the high school level. The next one is a three receiver smash concept, and I know that there's nothing crazy here um, that maybe some people haven't seen. Uh, I just think it's kind of underrated. You see a lot of two two by two smash or smash with a post. And I really think, you know, as a, as a high, low option, um, this version of smash, particularly with the switch between the two and the three receiver can create some advantages. So if you're looking to, you know, if you're looking at this against zone, um, obviously you're going to try and stop the wall player from getting out by running this inside hook. Okay. And then, you know, influence this halfback, Okay, and try and get your, your horizontal stretch on the halfback or your vertical stretch on the corner. Um, and where I really like it against man is especially when you run this switch, usually this Sam is going to be inside leverage. Um, and whether it's the straight up version or with the switch, and oftentimes the switch can kind of play with that leverage. Um, and now you're going to get that corner row back against their leverage, uh, which can be really tough in man-to-man -man coverage uh, for that Sam linebacker. And the last one is four verticals. We've, we've talked about, you know, the, my kind of preferred version of four verticals. Um, and, and I, you know, made, I made some of these diagrams, you know, with those as templates, but you know, the, the traditional uh, CFL four verts uh, where you've got, you know, some kind of underneath route and then four vertical rows. We'll talk about a few different ways to do that, that I think are high school friendly um, and, uh, and allow again, people to throw the ball downfield, whether it's second and long, uh, or, or even first and 10, you're just taking a shot or second and short and you're taking a shot. Um, you know, I think having a, a way for your quarterback to throw the ball down the field obviously is, is important. And, you know, what I, what I think you'll take away from this is it's not always about hitting the vertical. It's about giving your receiver some options. So we've talked about this before, the idea of a read seam where basically your quarterback is going to go pre-snap. If we have two on two, we like it. We'll play it. If we get pressure, like we'll see in one clip, is a great way to get the ball out of your quarterback's hands, having some kind of quick game over here. Okay. And then especially if we're getting cover three, right, we're going to pull out the, the the high players on either side with these outside verticals, and we're going to isolate the free safety. If we get some kind of cover four, we're going to give this number two receiver the option to run a bender where they're now going to bend underneath that field hash side coverage. Uh, and we can still make, you know, in, in some cases, a 12, 14, 16 yard completion before the yak, um, even against cover four with that bender. So those are the those are the concepts we're going to take a look at. I'm going to pull up my screen here and we'll get to some of the film. Um, like I've said, it really helps us out if you throw a like on the video. Uh, it goes a long way uh, towards more people finding it, um, which is obviously huge. Before we get to the film, I'm just going to throw a quick. Uh, a quick photo up on our Instagram, make sure people know we're on here as always, you know, please hit me up with questions, especially for the people watching this live. I want to make sure everybody's questions get answered. I, I can see the chat over here to my right. Um, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to hit us up with those. I'm going to get this in an Instagram story quick. The other thing for anyone who's interested uh, is don't don't ever be afraid to hit us up on social media. Ask us some questions. Um, you know, we're happy to help people out. Uh, and we do do uh, some consulting as well. So if you're interested in more of a deep dive into something, um, something that maybe you don't have the time to research that that we do for you or that we already have, um, please hit us up for that. We, we've got a couple of people already scheduled uh, for next week. Um, and like we mentioned on our last show, we will be switching from Tuesday nights as both Braden and I will be uh, coaching our, our club team on Tuesday nights. Uh, and we're figuring out a date to continue the, our weekly, our weekly webinars. So um, don't be afraid to hit us up for, for anything on social media. Uh, and we'll get into the film in a sec. All right.
Make sure my screen is shared here. Okay, so as we watch these again, please feel free to hit me up with any questions that you have. Uh, it's always good if you're if you're watching these to get your questions answered um, while you're watching it, as opposed to going back later and trying to figure it out. Um, so absolutely hit us up with any questions that you have. So looking at uh, our first concept was that zone read slice. Okay, and so here you'll see uh, we're going to get the zone read out of a three by two. This is a slot back, but again, it could be a fullback um, depending on your offense. And basically, we're just going to cross the set. And ultimately, what you're doing is at times you can be changing the strength of the formation, um, which can be tough for defenses to adjust to on the fly. Okay, and then you're going to get some kind of flood or pick concept. Okay, so you're going to see the little picker out here. You'll watch as 26 has to try and track across the formation. Quarterbacks able to pull, doesn't ultimately throw the slice. Okay, but again, you're able to see here, we're picking for the slice route. Okay, and then the quarterback's got options. It looks like they're just running a little smash concept on the outside here. So ultimately, quarterback has the option to keep and run. They have the kind of immediate dump off. You know, that's one of the things people get worried about their quarterback running with the football. You know, what if there's pressure? Okay, well, the end is chase the dive. So we're going to have some time to get on the perimeter here. Okay, that's the other big thing with, with zone read. And I think when you have a really athletic quarterback, they always want to be a playmaker and you don't want them to, to be timid or, or to not take opportunities when they're available, but they got to know when to give the football. Um, we'll get to that in a second with, with some clips of uh, some solid quality gives here as well. But you see here how this is tough for that track player to work on top through all this mess. They don't even do a great job with the actual pick. Quarterback gets the ball out on the edge. Right, and all these players back to the quarterback, right, playing off in zone, chasing the the uh, the slip, sitting on the pick. Often your quarterback can keep this and run as well. So depending on what pass concepts you have in your offense, this is a quick, you know, it's like a snag smash combination. Okay, um, but you could run this with flood. Uh, we'll get to some other concepts here in a sec. So again, talking about just trying to move the sticks especially for teams that play scrape exchange. All right. Which you're kind of seeing here with the chase and the overlap from the linebacker. Now you're threatening that linebacker zone, or at least you have the opportunity to. Same concept here. Again, this is uh, three by two with the W. The other uh, one I like off of this, which, which I could have drawn up as well, is if you get teams that want to play cut in the boundary, um, and, you know, you involve this receiver, they've got to decide how they want to play it. So is, is this player going to, are they going to rock and roll where the free safety comes down uh, or the boundary half, is he going to trace across? It can, it can make some people, you know, change their coverages up. But again, you see the movement at the second level of the defense. And it's not just when you pull the ball that you can get successful plays here. So again, Ottawa is running that same thing. They're running a little snag smash combination. So again, your smash should take up these two defenders off the board, right? We're trying to snag here. And again, if the quarterback's able to pull it, get the ball into that flat. Can you see from the tight? It looks like there's some kind of zone blitz going on here. It's a great job by the offensive line to pick up the most dangerous five. Okay, and then the running back gets vertical. One, one thing I really like um, when, we're, when you're running these kind of slips is make sure that your back isn't going, you know, you can run outside zone with it, but make sure your back is getting vertical because a lot of the time ends are going to get up the field and then we want to get in those vertical cutback lanes. Running back does a great job of squaring his shoulders here. And again, anytime you can stay ahead of the sticks, you know, you're running a base run play in your offense and you're picking up eight yards, you're going to be excited about that.
So I got a little bit of a late start on this one. Uh, subtle variation here. So this isn't actually the slip. It's just a three-man zone read. Um, so we have three receivers over here, and you're going to see this one receiver is going to run a bang route. That really replaces the slip. So whatever you're doing to create kind of an underneath throw option here, and then I think here we're going to get a sale combination. Uh, it's kind of flood. It's a little bit delayed. The timing is not great. You know, here you could argue that this should be a give, right? We're going to be able to have five on five and this defensive ends playing shuffle. Quarterback pulls it. You have your, you know, your flat control. So that pulls down the flat player. You know, especially when you're getting quarters, right? You, you got at least one player getting run off with the vertical. Here they're able to run that kind of flood concept and have lots of space to make that throw. So again, as if, if I'm the offensive coordinator in my, in my former job as a running backs coach, I'm really hoping that we get this give um, because we're in, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, I know the old linemen watching this are going, hey, what's the, why are we celebrating this completion? Because this thing could have cut back down that hash mark, right? But ultimately, you see the benefit there uh, of being able, the quarterback being able to pull and throw. Because if they do make a decision that's maybe not as ideal, now they don't have to rely on receivers blocking. They're able to throw the ball down the field. Again, a great way to, you know, get some chunk plays in the run game. Um, would love to see it given, but it is what it is. Here we go at a four by one. Uh, and this is really dangerous. Like if you think of the X's and O's behind this, and I know for a lot of Canadian coaches, uh, this maybe isn't groundbreaking stuff, but this is a really simple one. And to me, you know, you got to understand how teams are going to play your isolation sets. So when you have one receiver over here, how are they going to defend it, right? Clearly we have the boundary corners playing press. Uh, it looks like the halfback is in the boundary. So, you know, there, there's not maybe as much space as there could be over here. Um, but you'll see it looks like this flap, this player is, is playing, you know, at least somewhat responsible for the high zone on this hash mark. And so when we get this slip action, the will is going to get pulled in here. Uh, they're in a tight front here, um, but the will is going to get pulled in by the run. This corner is in some kind of man to man, or at least that's what they look like. They're playing responsibility on the player that runs the snag. And then you see a really clean zone read pull find that that slip player in the flat here and again watch i think it's seven comes off the roof here to try and track this and you'll see that just the one man snag and now all this space you created here i say all the time when you're talking about the quick pass game or the rpo game um or the play action boot game. Anytime you get an athlete in this much space, imagine how well you'd have to block up outside zone to get a player into that much space, right? It's just a really efficient way, I think, to stay ahead of the sticks or convert. You know, here you got a, a second and four, right? And, you know, you're able to attach something to your run game that gives you an easy throw. You know, if, if, if you're in a, any, any type of offense, right, you got to be pretty sure your quarterback can make that throw, right? That's like a free throw in basketball. You know, the flat... And then with the yak, that ends up being a 12-yard play, right? And that's a whole lot easier than, you know, throwing a timing route or, or something to get those 12 yards. Again, please throw your questions in the chat. Uh, I know it's a, a rainy Saturday afternoon and, and we're just getting by here. But if you have any questions, again, it can be about this or anything else. Please throw them in there. You see the effectiveness, number two, sorry. You see the effectiveness on the snag route here. Just a little pick, nothing illegal, using this guy's rules against him. It's man-to-man. -man. I'm playing my player man-to-man. -man. They're not able to get the switch. Again, that's like a free throw in basketball. Ten feet, first down. So now we'll get into some of the zone lock stuff. Um, again, I apologize. I cut this one a little short. Okay, what we have here is really, really simple. Zone read, okay. We're going to isolate the will. The will in three by two is the conflict player. Right, he's responsible for dropping inside the underneath slot to this field if it's zone. All right, we're going to get two slants, one, two. Okay, you see the quarterback's open here reading that well. 
Will plays down, right? We see now the space that's created in the zone defense, pull, throw. That puts the ball on the carpet at the end. Um, but you see everything before that you got to like as a, as an offensive coach, right? We're in a situation where we get second and three defense is playing hard on the run, create an easy throw for a first down using that zone lock RPO. I'll go to the next clip to draw it up. Cause I think it'll show up a little bit better. Perfect. Okay. So here's another great clip. We talk about who's in conflict, right? Who's in conflict being a huge um, piece of, what is going to make RPO successful? You can't just run the same RPO out of different formations and expect easy, clear reads if you don't totally understand how the defense is actually aligning uh, to that formation. So let's take a look here. This is uh, this is four by one, um, and BC lines are are about to run uh, that zone lock RPO into the boundary again. Some people call it a glance. Okay, it just depends kind of on the depth. I think if if the RPO police are watching, I think um, I think if it's a little deeper than six, they'll probably call it a glance instead of a slant. Um, but that that glance route or slant route is a great way to beat man coverage if that's the answer um, that the that the defense is giving you. So in four by one, in four by one, you need to understand where the boundary half is usually or whoever is going to be the second defender in the boundary. So here, this is the boundary half. He is relating to the number four receiver. He's coming over to the field side or HBO. -ing. Okay. So now we have a huge amount of space in the boundary. This will is 100% in conflict, right? The will is the only player that can help on this slant glance rep, right? So we have the will in conflict. It's important to note that if this boundary half sits over here and doubles the X receiver, Okay, and we have a two by one. If this boundary half were to be over here, that will is not really in conflict anymore, right? Especially if this team is thinking about how are they going to defend RPOs um, and, and they have some sort of plan for defending those RPOs. Usually that will is not in conflict. Now, who's going to be in conflict? Again, if this player is not here, now my mic is going to be in conflict to the field because even though I have my Sam, my halfback, my, and my field corner, okay, and even my free safety, who I mean generally is pretty deep. It that's four on four to the field, right? Every zone concept wants to be five on four. So now we can know that the mic is going to relate to the field. So understanding who's in conflict is key. Did we did get a good question about the slice uh, concept there through our Instagram? Uh, what are you coaching the slice player to do? Um, that I think it depends on who's running it and what what you're looking to get out of it. Um, my main thing is if it's a fullback trying to keep it a little simpler because they're not, you know, obviously catching the ball as much. Um, we might let that, if it's a fullback, be a little tighter than the line of scrimmage, really just trying to avoid contact with the defensive end. Uh, if you can, if you're running it from the slot, you know, timing it up. I prefer it where the, the slip or slice player is after the snap. Um, it, it, I think it hides the motion a little later. And, and I think it just makes it clear, Hey, we don't want you to try and cross the snap. Um, you know, we don't want you to try and cross the center quarterback and then you can kind of go slow to and accelerate through and then just get your, your, your chin to your, to your shoulder right away. Um, if I can go back a couple clips, that slice player. Um, so as we come across again, after the snap, you want to be at least two yards. I would say three yards behind the line of scrimmage because you never know what's going to come flying through. And as soon as we cross, you know, as soon as we get our free release, we want to get our chin to our shoulder because uh, if this quarterback's pressure, and you see it right there, um, you know, if that quarterback gets pressured, right, you can really see it here, even on the slow-mo, bang, chin to our shoulder. We want to be a target right away. And then once we catch the ball, we want to get vertical as quick as we can. So if we can, taking a drop step with our outside leg uh, and getting up the field, assuming the ball is put on your outside shoulder. Good, good question there. So again, because the halfback is over, right, we know that this will is in conflict and we can now exploit the decision made by the will. Will here steps up. We're able to pull the ball out of the belly of the back. And again, now we're one-on-one. -on -one. And the reason why I like the slant is we still have a good chance to win against man-to-man. -man. That's pretty good man coverage. 
Second and five. This might be, yeah, second and five. Able to throw the slant in that window. And again, after the yak, that's another reason why I love the slant, is you're going to get a fair amount of yak yards. You know, that ends up being like a 15, 16 yard gain. Appreciate it, Coach Butler. Excited to have you on here in the next couple of days. Speaking of good, uh, speaking of good content, good stuff on YouTube. Check out Coach David Butler's channel. He's gonna uh, hop on another international coach uh, and is gonna do some stuff with us in the next couple of days. We're just figuring out a time that works with that with the uh, the uh, North America time uh, to Canada or sorry North America to UK time difference, um, but we'll get it figured out. So here again, you see the bind twenty sevens in where. He's responsible for the A gap, which makes his job even harder, right? And if he doesn't step up, if he stays at depth, right, we're probably going to get a pretty good chance to get through that bottleneck. And sure, it might not be a 20-yard gain because this player is unblocked, but we're probably going to pick up that first down. Here's another key point on these is if you don't get the ball as the running back, you have to block the linebacker you're RPOing. So let's, let's say, and I, and I know this doesn't play out that way, let's say 27 walks up and blitzes, right? Some coaches will tell you, don't even go for the fake, just block 27 uh, and, and we'll be able to pull and throw off of it. Just got a bunch of new people on here. Um, if you can't throw a like on the video, it helps us out a ton. And uh, don't be afraid to ask us a question in the chat. Um, here, so now we're gonna get to the play action stuff. Uh, and I think that everyone gets excited about RPOs and I think there's a huge place for play action to, you know, still in the game. Um, whether that's protecting your RPOs or just, you know, old school, you know, play action boot, that type of stuff. One of the things I love that I've seen again and again recently as I watch more CFL games is trying to throw the play action. So this right here, this looks like it's either going to be run this way or bootleg to the field with some kind of catch up drag, right? Something probably like that. Okay. That great play in itself. Um, no problems with it. Love the bootleg as a defensive coach. It stresses me out if a team has a good boot game. Um, cause I know it puts a lot of stress and challenge on the defensive end. What I love about this concept, and we'll get to a few different ways to do it is if you, if you're already running bootleg, this is a great, um, compliment to that. Uh, but it's also another thing that you could do, even if you're not running bootleg, you could run this as a drop back play action. So you see here how, again, this looks like it's going to be boot to the field. The quarterback's now going to settle, okay? Um, you'll see to the field side here, it's already two back, and they're going to bring in another receiver to max the pro. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do that. You could keep the running back in and try and drag this player underneath. Most teams I've seen are bringing in the extra player, again, to make it look like bootleg, and then they're actually getting the running back out into the flat. Here's I started with this one because it's the simplest version. You're going to get this walk down from the number one and you're going to get kind of a deep inverted corner. So it looks like it's about to be, you know, your over route in the bootleg, which gets this player thinking, Hey, he's going to the field. If, if it's a man to man situation, it gets this player thinking, Hey, I'm about to have to run this across the field. You see him open up. He's thinking this is going to be, you know, opposite hash mark in terms of a landmark and then able to snap it vertical and get back to the corner. And you see the leverage position to put this player in. And now all we need to do is control the flat player. So here it's a little bang route. And that controls the flat player. Okay. And then again, you're able to throw this shot on top to the corner. Backside, you're going to get some form of drag, again, to kind of complete that three levels. Great shot. Touchdown. Okay, here's – I know I said CFL, uh, but this is Montreal, and it's uh, – you know, the offense is run by Coach Anthony Calvillo. So I'm going to say there's some CFL influence here as well. Uh, and it was too good of a play for me to not show – fit right in. So here, they're in, you know, 21 personnel. Personal favorite of mine is a former tight ends fullback, – fullback tight ends coach. Okay, I love the 21 personnel. So they got a tight end here. So this ends up being the exact same look. There's a tight end of the field and then a wing instead of that receiver bombering in. You'll see that same kind of switch action. 
Again, it looks like right now, again, it looks like what are we thinking about? Hey, we're creating space to run the deep out over, right? And then we might get a second post here. Again, Max Pro, the running back can check this. I love the little the chip on the defensive end and getting to the flat. I think it's a great way to draw the linebacker down. And then we got two on two. The little subtle look to the post gets the defender to open his hips and then back out into that kind of sail route. And again, you got your your post, your deep post here taking the top off the defense. There's your three level high low. We get man as opposed to zone. So we're not able to really flood the zone, but in man to man, you know, that, that look like it's going to become boot to the field and then bang that back out. Gives you a nice, easy shot. Again, if you look here, the, the length of the throw, it's off the hash. Again, I think this is a very makeable throw for high school students um, for, for younger quarterbacks. I think it's very much a makeable throw um, and, and it's still a big chunk play. Right, I can't tell. Look, looking at the sticks here, this might be first and uh, it's oh, sorry, this is second and short. Love it down distance where you might go for it on third down. Probably getting man to man, able to get you know a 17, 18, 19 yard chunk play. Here's a uh, last version of it, and again, this is a little bit different. This is one of the ones I was able to find today. Okay, you're going to get tight bunch. I want to do a video on tight bunch in, in the CFL game. I think there's a lot of great stuff out of it um, at that, that I'd like to show as well. But you get a little jet sweep, play action. Okay, now here, the seven-man pro is the tight end stepping down and the tailback adding on. And now we're getting those flood routes from the opposite side of the field. So this is a little more straight back pass game. Okay, here you could get, it looks like it's a straight vertical. And you see those three levels develop nicely. And again, this isn't a crazy long throw when you're throwing it into the boundary. If you're making that same throw to the field, that, that's probably 40% longer. But again, you're able to, to take the top off with some route on the outside here. And you get kind of that three level drag and drive underneath. Again, the play action here makes it tough for the linebackers. Everyone gets held down on the play action. The jet sweep is pulling the half back to the field and then we're able to get over the top. Again, the yak, I think that's speedy B. So you might not be able to count on that much yak, but again, you're in, you're in a position where you gotta feel pretty good about your opportunities. Okay, here's the uh, the three the three player smash. So you, you see it with the switch here, and I know there's a fair amount of motion going on that that gets some movement from the front, and you can't always guarantee that. Okay, but if you look at number one here, right, with that switch motion, you're going to get this a lot in cover one. This kind of like I/O posture where number one or the inside player here is going to take the first inside breaking route, and the the outside player is going to take the first outside breaking route. So here, our inside breaking route is going to become a corner. And when we sit down here, we get a really clear read. Are we going to dive down on it, opening up the space for the corner? Or are we going to stay soft, opening up the space for us to throw a nice layup out here to the stops? Here we get the drive down. So we know, hey, we're going to have high side leverage on this corner. Throw it skinny. You know, one broken tackle away from a touchdown there. But again, because it's in the boundary, I think it's a really good way uh, for high school programs to take shots. And again, if you look at this, you know, from a variety of looks, if this is, you know, if the half's low and the corner's off and you're getting some kind of zone, you have your kind of layup quick game out here, right? If you want to run it with the straight hooks, you're going to get the same look. Um, you know, you can also run it with the walk down um, and just switch the outside too. There's a million different ways you can dress up this concept. Uh, and I think it's just a tough look for, for cover one, cover three teams to defend. All right, four verts. 
and this will be one I know gets gets a fair amount of attention and and, and lots of looks. Uh, and we've talked about a couple of different ways to run four verts on this channel before, um, you know. But I, I thought it was again, if we're talking about five things, you know, that I think all teams should have a way to do. You got to have a way to throw the ball vertically down the field. Can't always be play action. Can't always be RPO. You got to have some element of drop back passing. It's going to threaten you down the field. And what I think the key to a vertical passing game is your quarterback feeling comfortable with non-vertical options. That's going to get them to actually go through their reads instead of just chucking it to your best receiver, um, which, you know, there are times you want that. There are times you want to isolate those one-on-one -on -one matchups. But if, if that receiver is not in a great matchup or if, if that receiver, you know, isn't in a leverage position based on the coverage, you don't always want your quarterback just taking, you know, their best player on, on the deep shot. You want them to be able to work through a progression in a way that gives them options against a variety of coverages. Um, so you're going to see a few things here. Um, on the back side of this, we're going to get, you know, the, the four verts part is going to come from the wide outs. Okay. And then the field slot and the field number three attacking those uh, traditional four vertical windows in the seams. Okay. On the back side, you're going to give this kind of quick game option. So you can see here, if I stop it, here's our four verticals. And we'll talk about a few things here. But number one, the other thing you want to have is where am I going to go as a quarterback if there's pressure, right? All these concepts are great until you get heated up and you need to go somewhere with the football. Um, and so I think another thing I, I like about a variety of these CFL four verts looks is you have your opportunity to go deep, um, but you also have your hots built in. You're not just relying on the protection holding up. So you're going to see often on the back side, okay, of, the, of a three by two set when the team's running four verticals, you're going to see a variety of quick games. It might be corner uh, slant drag or bang. It might be like we have here fade out. It could be double stops. There's a lot you can do, but you want to have something for the quarterback to take if you get pressure. So we do get pressure here and we have an option to go to right away. Quarterback feels comfortable. It makes a good throw, right? Yeah. We didn't get a chance to take that chunk shot that we want down the field but we made a safe throw, gives our player an opportunity uh, to make a play with the ball in their hands. So let's talk about the actual vertical portion of this. So if we had a little more time to read this out, and there's obviously one high safety here, this just looks like cover one, okay? You're gonna get, in most four verticals, you're gonna get your outside two vert runners. You know, um, you, you could argue the quarterback could take a pre-snap shot here, We've got, you know, this guy's already in trail. Um, being able to take that vertical shot, you could. Tough throw. What you really want to see is, is anyone defending the boundary hash mark? That's what we're going to try and hit first with this kind of over post. It's very similar to the American Y cross, uh, a little bit deeper uh, with the waggle here in Canada. We can get a little further down the field. Um, and so you'll see one of the keys is the route running here from the, uh, from the H receiver. He's trying to step on the toes. We want to get underneath the Sam. If the Sam's backing off this far, we can't, we can't keep going outside of him. All right. We can then just get it to our landmark on the opposite hash. Um, and this is a pretty good one, about 15 yards in that opposite hash. So you could argue as this quarterback, we could stand in, try and drill this throw in the opposite hash. Um, and as this receiver here, it's clear to us, hey, this player's backing up. We're never going to get on top of that. And so you'll see him start to look inside here on a post. You can really bend into that space, get your, get your, uh, get your chin to your shoulder and try and find that space on your hash. Uh, and we'll get to a few examples of that here. So again, here it's like a bit of a spacing concept, swing the back. They're going to try and run the under with a little pick route to hold the will. And then we're threatening opposite hash and field side hash. So again, you see here this, again, we talk about having options before the sticks. This player sees, hey, I'm never going to get on top. I'm capped to steal some R4 terminology. So now I'm going to get my chin to my shoulder. I'm going to bend into this space. The only player left is this halfback who's being occupied by the first post. And again, you're able to get the throw you want down the field into that window. All right. 
so that's that's our offensive stuff uh, that I wanted to cover. I'm going to jump into some defensive stuff again now. Um, make sure you throw a like on the video if you haven't already. Subscribe to us, all that good stuff. Um, it's really going to help us out, you know, as we keep trying to build this brand and and keep con- free content coming um, for all the coaches out there. I'm just going to throw something quick again on our Twitter and Instagram that we're going to be talking defense now. Um, but if anyone had any questions uh, on our first. Uh, on our first part of the video, now's a great time to throw them in the chat. And um, we're going to dive into talking about defense here in a minute. Just going to throw a quick note on our Twitter uh, that we're talking defense now. All right, let's dive into it. So um, I wanted to talk about a few different things defensively. I know defensively, obviously, there's when you're when you're watching film. Sometimes I think it can be harder than offense to really identify exactly what the rules are um, because they're going to relate to the the offensive plays you see. Um, so, for example, you might see one play and it's always in a first down context in the film that you have, and and so you're only ever seeing kind of that side of it, whatever. You might not see it against vertical pass game. You might only see it against quick game, run game, whatever it is. Uh, but there's a couple of things, I think, defensively that can help you take your playbook to the next level um, in terms of putting your athletes in position to be successful. Uh, so, again, this is just kind of five concepts I wanted to share with coaches um, from a defensive standpoint. Uh, and, and any questions, again, please throw them in the chat. So this one's really common. I saw Calgary do this. I've seen Toronto do this. I've seen BC do this, a number of teams. And that's a wide mug front. Now, you know, being walking up your middle linebacker is hardly revolutionary. Um, so this being the mic here, walking up your middle linebacker and playing with two, three techniques. Uh, here we have a three and, and what looks like a two technique is not revolutionary necessarily. Um, but what a lot of teams are starting to do out of it to defend, you know, zone run game, I think can be really, really effective. So, there's a little bit of window dressing here with some of these other players. Again, this is, I think, the boundary halfback uh, relating to the boundary tight end. So because now there's a D gap, that's being taken care of by the boundary halfback. Here's the Sam linebacker uh, because number 15 is kind of bombarded into the box here. That's who's taking care of that. So we can kind of isolate those players um, out of it in, in this sense um, and, and take a look at what everybody else is doing. So you have your two defensive ends um, who are playing uh, – who are playing the C gap, they're both going to be shuffle players. So what we're looking at here is playing a wide mug and trying to use it to defend zone read and some simple stunts that people do out of it. Um, so I called it trace uh, when I was making my own notes, cause that was the best way I could describe it. Um, and, and what made sense to me, but looking at here, basically what we're going to try and do, or the Argos are trying to do in this case is they're going to say, okay, we're getting some form of uh, we're getting lots of zone run game. We want to give this a good first down call, play cover one behind it. Um, or you could play cover three zone behind it as well. But we're going to take the mic out of the pass distribution. We're, we're going to blitz the mic. Okay. Now we don't want to just blitz the mic to a spot um, and, and hope we run into the play uh, and he can just use his, his big physical nature to make the play. We're going to try and play some games in the front to make this harder. Now, the offense is in pistol here, um, and I'm going to let this run in a second. But basically what this stunt is, is both defensive tackles. There's a few different ways I think you could do it. Again, watching the film and different teams doing it a few different ways. I've seen them do it. Both defensive tackles are going to stunt to the A-gaps. Now, if you get a, a team where the running back is offset, you could just have your uh, your – player opposite stunt to the a gap but we want to we want to try and spike the a gaps and force the ball out of the a gaps and then the mic is going to mirror the center so we get zone this way so we're going to spike spike and the mic is going to mirror the center into that play side b gap so essentially the mic is always going to wind up play side because especially in the zone game 
the mic is going to fall that center. Now, if you get a puller, just like anything else, the mic's going to have to read out and play to the puller. So for example, if the center step this way, but we pulled the guard, okay, the mic's going to have to read that and scrape back over the top, just like he, he would have to in any situation with a puller. So we're going to spike the A. Both ends are going to sit and play the C. So if we get any kind of zone read, again, ignoring these kind of added players, um, we're going to force the give. We want the ball to be handed off. Our resources are inside in the box here. So any sort of zone read or, or RPO, we want the ball handed off. And then our mic is going to trace to that play side gap, that play side B gap. And then our will is going to trace the running back. So what I mean by that is what can happen a lot of the times is we see this running back cut back. Okay. As the zone fills one, somebody gets washed and the running back cuts back here. 27 just has the running back. If it bounces free hitter, if it plays backside free hitter. I'll try and play this a little bit slow-mo. So again, center steps this way. We're going to fit into that double team. Mike's going to play over the top. That's going to pull the center into the double team. By pulling the center into the double team, we should make life hard on this guard as we stunt back to the A gap. This should force the ball to cut back. And that's where our free hitter, the will, can fit into it like you see 27 do here. The running back does a nice job of trying to stay tight to the double team and making life a little hard for 27. But again, you see six on six. Again, if we're not counting, you know, right now we're not counting this player or this player because they're related to those extra players in the box. But again, we're able to get a free hitter in the box, six on six. That's what we want. So again, if, if we had an, a team that wasn't in pistol, you could just spike the field side three and you could even call it like you could even, you know, this mic doesn't have to read the center. You're just going to run the spike fold uh, away from the back. Um, but especially on zone, it makes things tough. Uh, and again, having your will um, or whoever you, your second linebacker is in your system, having them match the back, it's easy in pass coverage because that's who their player is. If you're playing cover one behind it. Um, and again, you're, you're blitzing your mic either way. So like, let's say this, you know, if this became play action, you're just going to get a five-man rush. Um, if this is, you know, any kind of drop back pass, you just run a little twist stunt. And again, if it's away from the back, you should be getting uh, that player there without having to read it. If there are a pistol, you can read it. Here, the mic almost overruns it. And I'm not sure whether, th like, this defensive end seems to square up in, in the C gap. I, I think that's what they want to do. The other thing you could is, is you know, run it. We'll, we'll talk about a heavy five technique. You could do it with a heavy five and have the mic scrape all the way around a little bit harder. Um, but what I love about it is your ability. Like if your will is one of your better athletes on the defense, let your mic go handle the blockers up front and let this guy play sideline to sideline uh, and fill things up in the run game. So that's the wide mug trace. Okay, the second thing that I'm seeing, you know, all over the CFL now uh, and, you know, McMaster and, and Ottawa and some other teams uh, have had a lot of success with it in the OUA. Uh, and that's fire zone pressure. And it's something that's, you know, maybe a little older that's coming back into phase with, with more teams, um, you know, with more teams playing with a fullback on the field. Uh, it's great in the run game. And it's also great in the pass game, trying to overload protections uh, while still playing zone coverage. So basically – if you're unfamiliar with it, a fire zone pressure is usually some kind of overload pressure where you're going to play cover three or cover four behind it. Um, and you're not going to have your traditional pass distribution. What I mean by that is you're not going to have, you know, when you rush four, you're able to have, you know, four on three and three on two um, and, and, or if it's quads, five on four relationships between defensive backs uh, or cover players and receivers. Uh, when you're playing fire zone pressure, you're bringing, uh, you know, five or six players and playing zone behind it. Um, so you're not going to have that traditional relationship. Usually you're going to use spot drops, and we'll talk about that in a sec, uh, to try and vision the quarterback and defend the routes the quarterback's actually reading, um, as opposed to defending all the routes in the field. So here you'll see the, the zone pressure. Um, and again, Toronto's walked up as a second and medium. You know, they've got, you know, some stand-up players here. Only no one's in a four point stand or three point stance. You don't have to get that exotic with it, but basically, you know, you're going to walk some players up, 
Some are gonna come, some are gonna drop. Here we're gonna get an overload pressure from the field. So we're gonna get, you know, and I think in terms of personnel, uh, Mike and Sam off the field edge, long stick down inside. And I think they end up bringing six and they're dropping the will out here. Yeah, so, and again, hard to tell exactly what the specific coverage rules are here, uh, especially because it's four by one. Um, things can change a little bit, but taking a look at this here, you see the will who's dropping out. You end up with your will and your halfback as kind of these low seam players, right? Trying to relate to whatever shows up in the seam first because it's four by one. Um, you know, I think they might be basically playing man to man on the backside here and then having these five players try and relate to the, the four to the field. So you see this play out really well here because they're able to rob that kind of hot route. And then, you know, it just looks like a cover four shell here. Quarterback can't go to his two hot routes immediately. Again, when we talk about defending the routes, the quarterback's processing, um, you want to be on top of the verticals, but your underneath players can really read the eyes of the quarterback and try and get in those throwing windows. So usually what you're going to get, and again, because this one's four by one, it can be hard to see. If you're playing three high, um, and you're bringing six that, that leaves you with three players underneath. Usually you're going to get some kind of flat middle of the field and flat with your, your kind of, you know, your, your traditional cover three defense behind it. You can even go cover four where you're going to play hash, hash numbers and numbers, um, with two underneath. And then obviously you're a little more susceptible to anything thrown underneath, but you can rally to it. So again, here you see. This is looking like it's somewhere in between um, whether he's robbing playing kind of this seam first and then looking to rob anything that's deep over the middle of the field. As the routes declare, and again, you see where the quarterback's eyes are, right? They're able to take away those three routes, ultimately force a pick. Here it is from the tight. Again, you're trying to overload one aspect of the uh, of the protection. So you see here, we're getting four to the slide side. Now they've, they've got the back over here as well, but you're getting some kind of four man rush is gonna stress that side of the protection. And then one of the things I like is uh, they actually crash away from it and run this little loop stunt. And you see how it kind of forces the quarterback out to where the loop stunt's going to finish up and then they're able to get the pick. This is actually the exact same pressure, uh, just out of three by two. And now they're going to bring it from the boundary. So here you get your kind of more clear three deep one, two and three, and then your three underneath defenders, middle of the field, hash the flat and then you know just based on the the corners playing cut on that side ends up a little bit wider but you got your kind of middle of the field flat flat and then your three third players and again you're a little more spot drop eyes on the quarterback visioning the quarterback here so you can kind of play in these windows and they're actually able to scramble and get a completion here again i think it ends up being short of the sticks but, you know, anytime you can get the quarterback off his spot, you got the verticals taken care of. Right, you're able to rally down, force the third down. So the pressure path, I mean, you have lots of options. Um, obviously, you can, you can create pressure in a number of different ways with a number of different paths. What I like about this one, again, is how they run this little, uh, like, jab pop stunt on the backside forcing the quarterback into this rusher. Gets a little lucky. He's got that outlet there. But you can get really, really creative with the front. You know, Scott Brady did a great presentation for us on generating pressure as Max, defensive coordinator. Um, and uh, you can watch that as well. But just seeing a lot more of this in the CFL game now. Here's a similar version. I think they're only bringing five here. So you see when you bring five, um, you're, you're able to have a few more in or one more in coverage. You're able to have seven, you know, in coverage. So here 
Um, they're, they're playing, they're bringing the free safety. This is the free safety run down the line of scrimmage, but you get your kind of shell here, four deep, three underneath. Again, this looks, this will bring us to our next conversation, which is double cut. Okay. Here they're really kind of playing a double cut fire zone. Um, where again, you're one short in coverage, but you're, you're really bringing the, the extra pressure uh, and usually trying to overload the protection. So we saw a, a boundary side and a field side pressure. This would be, I guess, another field side pressure because you do have the Sam linebacker, but they're also bringing the free safety here. Um, so you're also attacking the interior of the pressure as well. So again, especially away from the running back, this is tough. And you'll see drop the defensive end. That can be a really common one um, to, to let you have another rusher. Um, occupies the tackle long enough, forces the running back here to cross the formation, which is tough to pick up that extra rusher. And again, that zone coverage aspect doesn't let, you know, if, if you do a nice job with your eyes, doesn't let the quarterback just get the ball out. This is just out of a 30. And again, this isn't crazy complicated, um, but again, you're bringing five and playing zone underneath. This is maybe less in the true fire zone um, because they're not dropping a defensive end because they're already in the 30. Um, but again, you're bringing five players and still playing zone behind it. You're able to take away those immediate hots, which might be available to an offense uh, if you're playing, bringing man to man pressure. Uh, and play zone behind it. Again, feel free, any questions or comments you have, please throw them in the chat. Even if it's just where you're watching from, it helps more people or it helps YouTube fire out. Um, you know, YouTube will send it out to more people, the more people that uh, are commenting on it. So it's a huge help to us. Second thing I saw, which which is again, not revolutionary, but I think, you know, something based on offenses that they're becoming more popular is, is beneficial is double cut coverage. Um, and the nuances behind how people are playing double cut coverage now. So some people call this umbrella. You know, again, I'm not sure what the down distance is here. It doesn't necessarily mean that your cut players have to be 15 yards off the ball here um, and, or your, your vertical players and that your cut players have to be nine. Certainly you could be a little more aggressive depending on down and distance. But the reason I really like double cut is you're able to force – you know, the, any vertical, like if we talked about that last uh, that last four verts we were talking about, you know, trying to hit these two seams, it really floods those seams and forces offenses to throw the ball um, outside uh, vertically, which we all know quarterbacks oftentimes, you know, the arm strength isn't there to make those throws. So by playing double cut, you really cap the interior verticals and force offenses to try and hurt you on the outside. And that lets you play uh, like a cut and carry with the corners. Um, and, you know, I think having that opportunity at the corner is a little bit easier often because your, your receiver that you're predominantly responsible for, the number one receiver, is usually on the line of scrimmage. So when we talk about a cut and carry or carrying a vertical, we're talking about, hey, you're going to play the flat, but if your player goes vertical, you're going to take it. Or if both players go vertical, you're going to handle the outside vertical and the halfback will handle the inside vertical. That's traditionally what we mean by cut and carry. And though it's easier for a corner to do that's really hard for a half to carry a vertical um, because again, usually they're dealing with a player that has a waggle. So you'll see here, and again, this is I think a second and very long. So it's a little softer than, than you might on a first and 10, but just your ability to, to check vertical routes off. So, you know, really almost all five players are going vertical here. And we're able to take away the verticals from the inside three with our three high players and then cut and carry the verticals on the outside. Okay. It also makes things really, really clear for your linebackers. Hey, we got to push into this window. We got to push into this window. You know, here we got to push into this window. So the linebackers then are going to get underneath those in interior receivers. And being able to cut and carry the outside verticals takes some of the stress off the high players. So again, this is, you know, now I see the sticks there. It's like second and 20, force them to check it down to the back, go make a vice tackle. Exactly what you want. Again, this one's got a bit of a late start, but again, you see on the outside here, 
three deep, we're going to take away the interior vertical options, right? And we're going to be in a position to play 70-30 on any sort of high-low. So we're going to force this team offensively. Hey, if you're going to run that smash concept, right, we're going to force you to take the crumbs underneath, okay, and then we can rally down and make that tackle. So this is just much easier to do on the outside also because you can vision. There's no other receiver out here. So you can vision everything you need from this kind of open key stance. So double cuts, not something that I ran a ton of uh, in my history as a defensive coordinator, but definitely something I'd like to get into um, just because it lets you play that kind of cut and carry on the outside with the corners um, and lets them play 70, 30, see everything and, you know, be as aggressive as they need to be. Um, on on balls that are thrown to that flat um pretty simple concept i think a lot of people play uh are playing you know basic cover three uh especially in high school uh and you know ultimately for me um the biggest difference is you know you have leverage on all these verticals you don't have to worry about the corner folding on top uh if you get that traditional you know if this halfback was low and this corner was high this corner would have to play outside in on this vertical which can be tough Whereas when you're in double cut, they don't have to do that. All right. This is probably one of the favorite things I've learned um, in the last couple of years defensively. Uh, and I got to give credit to uh, now Western's defensive line coach, Kevin McNeil, um, who was working with us at Laurier for a year. Um, and we got talking about some different things, you know, how to rush the quarterback. And he brought this up. And at the time, I hadn't seen very many people run it. thought it was a cool idea. Uh, so I'll give credit to KMAC for this one. Um, but I've done some more research and, and found some more teams that are running it and different ways to run it. Uh, it's a really common uh, way that Georgia uses to rush the passer on second long. I think one of the big challenges facing offenses, you know, in the, you know, the modern era is mobile quarterbacks. And so you need a plan to get to mobile quarterbacks. You have to have ways to disrupt the pocket. Uh, and you have to do that without necessarily playing as much man-to-man -man as you could in the past because um, passing games are better and, and the rules are harder in terms of what pass interference is versus what it was maybe back in the day. Um, and so, you know, all those things lead me to always finding ways, how can I get pressure with four, right? And one of the ways you can get pressure with four is to have four great defensive linemen. Awesome. If you have that, cut them loose, play two, three techniques, run a couple stunts, life's good. Um, if, if you're looking for ways to create pressure, one of my favorite, favorite ways to do it is, I, I think Georgia calls it, uh, odd hunt it's in their odd mirror package um, or and basically a, a, a different way to spy the quarterback and create a little more pressure so here we see it and we this one's all nicely annotated because we did it for one of our uh, play of the weeks uh, which we're going to get back to here in July now, now that report card season's done for me and we got a little more time basically what we're going to try and do and I have some couple clips of a couple teams running it is we are going to try and to the side of the running back, we're going to spike the defensive end inside. That's usually the man side of the protection. So if, I, if the white lines here are the protection, we're usually saying, hey, if the running back's on this side, typically that's the side of his responsibility. He's probably reading from this linebacker uh, to the next linebacker out of the box. Typically, you're going to go one, two, three, four with the against the 30 with the four-man slide here. Okay, And we're going to get the backside tackle one-on-one. -on -one. So we're going to spike the end to the back side, uh, uh, to the side of the back to break the pocket. Okay. We want this quarterback to have to either back up or get out. Then the nose is going to, is going to work uh, away from the back. So the nose is, and, I, and I've seen teams do this where the nose will, will actually stunt to the back and they don't spy with the linebacker. If you're really trying to get pressure with three, um, but the nose here I have drawn up is spiking away from the back. Again, trying to force the quarterback, the, prevent the quarterback from stepping up, right? We don't want the quarterback to be able to get up into this B gap. We want the quarterback to have to go back and out. Our end away from the back is going to run. So I've heard it called run the hoop, uh, the long loop, a um, bunch of different things. But basically, they are going to run through the bottom of the pocket. So they have no responsibility if the quarterback steps up. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. But they are going to run around this offensive tackle and run the hoop in behind the quarterback and actually try and get to the quarterback as they escape to this side. Now, 
This is where I particularly like it out of a three down front. It's not that you can't do this out of a four down front, um, but both linebackers, and I would prefer actually to walk both linebackers up on the guards because you might get five on five, big on big um, in that case. Uh, and it also can create a little more confusion um, and, and, and make things a little easier for this player spiking inside. Uh, but they are going to spy the back and or spy the quarterback and the the player away from the side of the back has the quarterback. So if this back wants to run a swing check release, then this backer is going to peel out. And now this backer is going to have the quarterback. Again, if he tries to step up, if the nose doesn't do his job, he'll play him here. If he tries to, you know, as, as he tries to get out from this pressure, um, he'll scrape over the top. Okay. So if the back were to release this way, the opposite would happen. This backer would peel with the back. And now this backer has the quarterback. So again, you'll see the back protects. So really we're going to get two spies on this, which is great. You can see the, the, the two different rushes by the defensive end. This end is going underneath to break the pocket. This end is flying, speed rush up the field. No concern with this quarterback stepping up. Again, if this quarterback were to step up here, hopefully between the nose and the end, we're able to get it. If not, uh, the spy player has to be able to help out there. Um, and with, especially with the back staying in, we should be good with two linebackers really able to, to play the quarterback here. Again, we forced the quarterback out exactly where we want him to go. We've only rushed three so far, so we've been able to drop a ton of players and take away windows, and now 45 should be free to play the quarterback, and we see the defensive end on the opposite side working that high, uh, that long loop, uh, and they're going to meet now with the quarterback. Again, we're able to get the quarterback to move off his spot, really with a three-man rush plus one delayed rusher. That obviously lets you, you know, play more complex coverages on the back end, take care of the verticals, um, you know, anytime you're getting pressure before, that's a winning business model. So here we're going to see it from Laval, uh, and, and this is a great clip from the side angle because you're going to see – here they're in pistols, so they must have just called it what side they want. You're going to see this end dive inside, and you're going to see – I think it's a blitzer. Or no, it's just the defensive end here run the long loop. So you're going to get that puncture, long loop, and then they meet at the quarterback. Here it is from the tight. Again, a little bit different here because they're walked up. Um, he, here, they're actually going to pick and then spy for the quarterback. So this is an interesting path because they have the linebacker pick the center and then fold through. So they're running almost a three-man game there with the long loop. So here they're manning up the back. There's the pick. And we're going to wrap around, play the quarterback. Again, one of, one of my favorite ways uh, to, to generate pressure um, and you can – obviously, there's a couple different examples there. You could do it out of a four-down front. So just while I got a four-down front drawn up here, uh, we want to spike to the back. Actually, I'll go to the tight. So, again, if you wanted to try and run this out of a four-down front, we're going to run the, the long loop away from the back. Uh spike spike to force the quarterback out i would put obviously your linebacker on the back so what i would do with this defensive lineman is have them run the loop back uh to this side but they could really engage this guard and then mirror the quarterback so they're going to get two spike players from this side and the long loop so they could kind of hold this spot and then loop to fold over um if if they got in that situation so um, the last concept uh, from a CFL standpoint, so we've, we've talked about uh, we've talked about the odd hunt rush, um, which which we did a play of the week for. If you want to check out on our social media, it's there as well. Uh, we talked about fire zone, we talked about uh, double cut, and we've talked about uh, the scrape. Okay, this is another um, you know I want to talk about one way to defend RPOs, and this is the simplest way. 
Um, I think to defend RPOs um, and especially at a high school level. Um, but I really, I think we've done a lot of good work on this channel recently on defending RPOs. So if you want to look more in detail, the stuff with, we did with Robbie Smith, as well as our defending RPOs clinic, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Uh, we just posted uh, last week, um, we did a, a tight front and three safety structure video. Uh, we just posted three shorter videos on the three safety stuff. We're going to try and get the tight front stuff out. Um, later this weekend. So lots of good stuff on defending RPOs on the channel. If that's something you want to dive into, you know, I think coming out of, you know, this, this lockdown up here in Canada and offensive coordinators have had too much time uh, on their laptops to not be running more RPOs. Um, and uh, so they're coming. So have a plan to defend them is, is, is key. So uh, to me, uh, when you're defending RPOs, you got to do one of two things. First escalation is you play man, and if you can defend the man to man, if you just get a little bit of RPO, that can be a, a functional solution. After that, I need ways to play zone coverages and take players out of conflict or minimize conflict. Okay. And the simplest way to do that, in my opinion, um, is to, uh, to play what we call a heavy five technique, which is really a relationship between your end and your end of linebacker. So uh, Robbie Smith, this is actually, I think it's him here. He, he did a, some work with us. He talked about calling this a jab technique. Um, we've called it a heavy five in other videos. Basically, you want a way to cover down on all the receivers uh, and have your linebacker fit the C gap instead of the traditional A or B gap. So if your linebacker is in the B gap or even worse in the A gap and they're in conflict, you're increasing the space between them and their responsibility. So I know right now the back is to the field. So unless you're getting full field RPO, this side's not likely to be RPO'd, um, but you are getting a lot of teams, you know, that are running, whether it's bubble and blocking this guy up and running the full field RPO, or they're running flop reads where they're, where they're, you know, blocking basically back and RPOing the front side linebacker away from the back, or you're getting it out of pistol. Either way, you want your, your five players in the box being, in this case, your four down lineman and your mic. They're in the fit. They're not in conflict. The two potential conflict players are your outside linebackers. So in this case, because the free safety is rotated to the field, right, we've got four on three here. This player is not in conflict. He doesn't have a gap, right? The mic and the two defensive linemen on the field side have the three gaps to the field. It's the backside player, the will, that has a gap and has a pass responsibility. So here they're actually playing that double cut we talked about. So you'll see the two, see how the mic is going to bury early. He is not in conflict, right? Out here, we're four on three. We're good. They can't throw any RPO out here without us, without us having a chance to get down on it right away, okay? The player that could be in conflict is this will. So what you're going to see here from the defensive end is they're going to engage the tackle and then dive inside to the B gap, forcing if the ball gets given for the ball to roll off the table. And now our will similar to the tight front can step up and play it from depth. So watch the difference in how fast the mic fits it versus the will. The will is hanging on this RPO a little bit longer. Now here, I don't think they're RPOing this side. I think they're RPOing the opposite side of the field. Okay, but it, it can be done where they're going to RPO away from the back or simply, you know, if this back was in pistol, right, you need to get six fitters to the party, but you don't want your sixth fitter to be stuck in the box where they're in a tremendous amount of conflict it can be beneficial for your sixth fitter to come from out of the box, meaning your end has to jab inside if they get run. So, for example, this is drop back pass. This end's going to rush, right? If we got, you know, uh, if, if we got, say, outside zone of the field, they can chase. But when they get a back block here, a base block, we're going to dive inside, kicking the ball out to the C gap where the backer has a little more time to fit it. So here they get zone read. And you'll see the end work inside. So they're going here, you know, we're, they're blocking out. And we're going to get our sixth fitter dive inside and now fit the edge. So you'll see if this ball gets given, right? And I know the interior D line do a great job. Mike blows this up, all that good stuff. But even if these players are blocked, by the end going inside, 
it's going to force the ball off the table. And again, the will can now play it from depth uh, and make that tackle. Um, so that's a heavy five technique. And again, it can be super valuable. Let's say this was flipped. So say the back was over here. And now we're going to get zone read this way. You know, now this five could be heavy to this side. The other thing is if you get a down block, you can chase it and then have the will become the quarterback player. So um, five trends that I'm seeing on CFL defenses that I think can be really, really helpful. Um, like I mentioned, uh, we are going to be changing from Tuesday nights. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly when we're going to do it this week, but stay tuned to our social media uh, for when we're going live next. Thanks for watching. We're under 200 hours. We're 162 hours away um, from hitting our targets uh, in terms of getting to 4,000 watch hours. It would be huge. Um, so look out for lots more content coming from us uh, in the next little bit. Thanks again for watching. Uh, and if you have any questions, throw them in the chat. Haven't seen any for the last little bit, so I'll wait a minute. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'll sign off here. But any questions, throw them in the chat.